Uh, ghosts. I want to talk about ghosts this morning. Not ghosts, as in the fluffy white sheets, but the art of no, not the art, the act of ghosting. This is what we in the trade in the industry call uh, when we've submitted a quotation to a potential customer and we don't get a response at all. Just goes dead, goes quiet. I'm sure it happens in other industries, but uh, in our industry, it's really common because people often go out to market to get comparables, to get comparative quotes. So they might go out to market and get three quotes, four quotes, five quotes. I've even seen people getting 20 plus quotes. Uh, but the people that don't win the work, the people that they don't award the project to, the people that they don't award the job to, rarely get any sort of callback, feedback, um, any sort of, uh, sorry mate, you weren't, you weren't on point this time, you were too expensive, uh, the time frames don't work, all of those uh, reasons, all those reasons that you have to not appoint the person that you didn't appoint, is that right? Yeah. Then just just feedback is the message this morning. Pick up the phone, have the conversation with the unsuccessful bidder and have that conversation. You never know where that might, might go. You never know if it's time, maybe they can juggle some stuff around to fit you in. If it's price, maybe there's room for negotiation. Maybe there's some bits that they could recommend that you could do cheaper. The last thing that you wanna do is just ignore it. It's the ghost. That's the last thing that you wanna do. A, you're gonna reduce your um, supply chain. And what I mean by that is, if you need them again in the future, if you've ghosted them once, they aren't coming back a second time. They'll just think you're a time waster. Uh, two, it's fucking rude. Someone's gone out of their way to price at work. And even if that doesn't meet your expectation or your budget or your time scale, they've still put time in to put that thing together. Putting quotes together takes a long time and a lot of energy as well. You know, we have to, we have to go take measurements, go away, calculate stuff, speak to our own, our own supply chain if we're using contractors and material, supplying the materials. So all of that stuff, it does take time. So when these quotes come over, the message this morning is, if, if, that, uh, if that quote coming over doesn't meet your expectation in terms of time, in terms of price, in terms of quality, in terms of start date, whatever that is, payment terms, whatever it is, just feed that back, pick up the phone and feed it back. Feed back the objection, feed back the challenge, because you never know where that might go. And let me guarantee one thing, if you ghost them, you ghost that quote, nothing changes. If you ghost it, then there is no, there is no negotiation. There is no improving the time. There is no starting early. If you're not prepared to have that conversation. I don't understand why it happens to be fair. I don't understand why people have this trepidation as to pick up the phone. Maybe they think they're getting ripped off, that's usually not the case. You know, it's usually, it is usually, uh, maybe a fear, a bit of fear maybe. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. I was on this pricing up uh, work this morning and the subject of compliance came up. What I'm talking about with compliance is uh, legislative, I got that right, legislative compliance. Uh, we're talking uh, CDM regulations, uh, health and safety, all that, all that interesting stuff that uh, I try and dodge and Lisa makes me do, which is great. Uh, the other side of compliance, we're talking building control, planning permission, etc., etc. This forms part of our quote. It's not priced individually as a line item on a quote, but it's mentioned on there. So we, we morning, Jason. What we do when we compile, like compose, compile, compose, compile, whichever word we prefer, uh, that quotation is it's mentioned. So we put it in the quote, CDM compliance. Uh, local authority submissions. It'd be worded something like that. And the customers come back and said, how much will I save if I don't do that? Well, n nothing, because we've got to do it. Well, if you've got to do it, then uh, you need to pay for it. Not really, mate. You know, this compliance is, it's critical, it's essential, essential and it's built, into, it's built into the court. It's not something that you can dodge as much as I've tried. You've got to do it. This stuff you have to do. Jump onto the HSE's website. 
uh, and define what you are under that in that project. Nine times out of ten, property investors are commercial clients. So just Google um, duties of a commercial client under the CDM regs. CDM standing for Construction and Design Management Regulations. You've got to do this stuff, or you find yourself in hot water and maybe in front of the man with a curly wig. If if uh, if you ignore it, if you don't do it. Local authority planning permission, again, touch in with your local council. Make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. This one particular story, uh, honestly, this one, one particular story came up. Most of you will have heard this anyway, uh, but I was challenged to then talk about that this morning and also get the word cockwumble into the live. So there is that. That one's that. Number one's ticked off. Uh, number two. He share, share this, uh, share this tale. Well, he's working on a project in Sunny Scunny, Sunny Scunny. And the client had done his own rip out, pulled his own toilet out. And we're left with no welfare facilities on this particular job. So it's hiring a Thunderbox. You'll have seen these if you don't know what one is, a Thunderbox, a chemical toilet. One, the one, them big plastic things with the blue water inside them. So we've got this Thunderbox on the job and my labourer, Ian, turns up to them to work this particular day. I come on later on that day, do a bit of a site visit. I look out the bathroom window down the back garden. I see a pile of toilet roll in the middle of the garden. And this toilet roll was right in the middle. I think that's a strange place, you know. Not in the bushes, not in the borders, in the middle of the garden. So I went to investigate and there it was in the middle of the lawn, a big steamer. Big whippy, big turd in the middle of the lawn with toilet paper stuffed on top of it. So I go back in the house, kicking off. Oh shit, in the garden. Ian puts his hands up, oh, it was me. The mate, you need to go clean that up. I need to use the toilet. Because I'm not going in there. It's fucking minging. It's a thunderbox, but he's okay shit in the garden, like a dog. Anyway, he runs down the garden and he scoops up this turd with his bare hand carries it back through the house, past the Thunderbox where it was on the front of the house, and he threw it in the skip that was on the drive. That gobsmacked me for number one. He then gets his palm with the shit streak on it, and he wipes it down the edge of the skip to get the turd off his hand. And he then gets his hand and wipes it down his thigh to get any potential remnants, or maybe some tissue bits and bobs, also off his hand. I look at him, kind of open mouth, and say, did you just do that? And he was like, what? Like, that was fucking normal. Like, that was acceptable behaviour, to go do that. He got the sack that day, which was sad, because I actually liked the kid. But to, uh, that is all I want to show you this morning. I suppose it backs up to, having appropriate welfare facilities, which we did have on this particular job. Some of the ways that you can get around that is by not ripping out the bog on day one. You know, leave, leave that toilet in throughout the project. Have that flushing toilet. You know, Portloo's aren't the nicest place to go, particularly if it's cold, particularly if it's freezing cold. Uh, I want to talk about contingencies this morning. This is as a result of a q and I did on Friday, just gone. Then it came up on a webinar on Saturday. And I've had an email about it all over the weekend. So it must be a hot topic at the minute, just for whatever reason. I see so many posts on social media, particularly from uh, deal packages, maybe people that are going into a deal. They make the old, uh, make the old thumbnail on Canva and post a deal up. And I'm often seeing contingency, 10%, contingency, 5%, contingency, 50, whatever it is. Now I'm here to tell you that that approach is utter fucking bollocks. It's utter bollocks. And this is why. Let, first and foremost, we're using a percentage multiplier against the cost, against the build cost, the initial build cost or the revenue, whatever you want to call it. First and foremost is that that initial number, nine times out of 10 is a guess in the first place, or it's been worked out on some other formulaic approach. 
which is probably bollocks as well. So that contingency figure that we're applying to that, we're saying is a percentage representation of the initial cost. Now, the two things have got absolutely fuck all to do with each other. What I mean by that is, if we've got a 20 grand spend on a refurb, we're saying that a contingency, let's say 10%, 2,000 quid is going to buy us anything outside of what we've seen. So that percentage of that revenue, the relationship, it's immaterial. If the refurb is 10K, we're saying that the contingency is a grand. If the refurb is 30K, we're saying the contingency is three grand. Now that relationship between contingent and cost, money, doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. So a better way to do this thing is your contingency items and contingent items, potential contingent items, need to be calculated in advance and they become your contingency. So we've got to look at the risk, price up the risk, and that forms the contingency. So why would we have a contingency in the first place is going to be purely in case of, in case something comes up. Now we're not talking about items that we miss here. That's not contingency, that's you missing it. We're talking about items that are truly unforeseen. If we're digging an extension, what's the drainage situation going to be? So a risk item when digging an, uh, an extension may well be a collapse drain or, or a drain needs moving that we didn't know was there, as an example. So we've got to price up the movement of that piece of work or the replacement or repair of that piece of work. And that is the number that forms a part of the total contingency pot. And the cost of that work has got absolutely nothing to do with the price of the overall work that we're undertaking. So let's say again, let's say we're putting up a 20 grand extension and there's a risk item relative to the drainage. The price of the drainage has got absolutely nothing to do with the price of the extension. The three most common things that contingent contingency is uh, commonly needed for is rotten floor joists, plaster becoming delaminated from the substrate after the paper's been stripped and the roof. Now, those three things are all expensive, trust me. So if we're in a 10 or 15K refurb, 1,500 quid's not gonna cover it. So those items need pricing up advance and being dealt with as risk items to form the total contingency pot. It's about advice. People, uh, people on social media, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever it is, those folk that are uh, giving advice and folk that are asking for it as well. That advice might be solicit unsolicited or solicited. You could you could have asked for it. You may not have asked for it. It may just be someone giving it to you. Uh, the point I want to make is who who is it that you're taking that advice from? Now, would you take legal advice from a butcher or accountancy advice from I don't know a plasterer or something? Probably not. Yet so many folk out there still asking for advice in the wrong places. And they're giving it too, by the way. Like I said, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, these, don't get me wrong, these places when, you, when you're posting a question into a Facebook group or, or to someone, you, the, the right answer may well be in the comments. If you're asking in that type of forum, how do you know which one's the right answer? You just don't know. And if you don't know which is the right answer, that's just going to create more confusion and more options than you had when you was guessing. Uh, people asking how to do a remote refurb. How do I set about doing a remote refurb? A couple of guys in, I was getting this wrong, not Dubai, the other one, um, Abu Dhabi. And Londoners looking to invest up north. How do I do a remote refurb? But my, in one word, don't. In my experience, and through life, through my career, it is so difficult to manage a refurbishment project from distance. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it is so difficult. The things that are difficult is quality assurance. I hear people talk about, let's do photographs, let's do FaceTime and fucking WhatsApp video and all the rest of it. Or I've got a phone app that manages it, nah. 
not for me. It is not for me. So the answer to the question when it's asked of me is, I wouldn't do it, no chance. I know there are people out there that do do this. I know there are people out there that support other guys in doing this. And again, that's okay, as long as it's working. I watched a video, uh, I think it was over the weekend actually, some guy, uh, he was a remote investor from London again, uh, walking around his project in the northeast. It was a painted finish, so the property was pretty much finished. And he's gone up to do his snagging, fair play. And I have to say, I grant that the quality of work that I saw on the video was a bit shit. In fact, it was a lot of shit. A lot of the joinery looked like it had been cut with a set of teeth or a couple of spoons. Uh, it, it was crap. But one of the points that he made on the video was that the builder had put a wall in the wrong place. Put a stud wall in the wrong place. And put an ensuite bathroom in, back to front. Now, there's so many things wrong with that. You can't just go up on a snagging visit and find out those are things that are wrong. It's happened because he's managing it remotely and not managing a robust quality assurance procedure. We're talking about check-ins now, checking inspections, making sure that the project is running smoothly and it's running in accordance with a plan. So if we're going to check on finished work and then finding walls in wrong places and bathrooms in back to front, there's been a breakdown in that journey, in that remote process. And it's solely owing to the fact that it's remote. If that had been on your doorstep, that wouldn't have happened. When property investors, not just property investors, it's folk in general, are going out to get um, prices for elemental pieces of work for their build, and they're going out to market to get three quotes, I get the approach, I get the thought process behind it. I get why people want to do that. Now, here's the thing with it. If your initial inquiry that you're asking for doesn't have parity across the board, across those three inquiries, your three quotes mean absolutely nothing. Then your quotes don't, your three quotes aren't comparable. They can't ever be because, because they're not basing any sort of price around the same thing. So often, this this came to light as, as yesterday was, I went to price up a, uh, a refurb, I'm gonna call it a refurb, and I was walking around the house with a guy, he sent me a pretty loose specification, and when I say loose, it was better than normal. Uh, and one of, the light, one of the particular line items on this thing was replace all internal doors. So this is not a price that we provided, they just wanna make this point by using some numbers as a point of reference. So these, all internal doors, let's say, all internal doors, thousand quid. Let's say they're just asking me for that little piece of work. Let's say I go a thousand quid for all internal doors to be replaced. But me, I go price it up first. And I point out to the client that, listen mate, you could do it doing the liners as well. Morning Jim. You could do it doing the liners as well. So you might need new door liners, which means taking off the arcs, arc trip, taking the liner out, replacing the liner, putting the door back. So I'm now gonna add in, and the, and the guy that's walking around might go, yeah, yeah, do me that, do me that. But remember that the initial inquiry was just about doors. So we're asking about liners, Morning Bar Tech. We're asking about, I ask him to include Morning Michael to include liners as well. And that's then gonna include replacement architrave, maybe even skirting board. So I'm gonna add all this stuff up and my, what was a thousand pound price might now be two. Liners, lintels, architraves, bit of skirt as well. But, so he's got the two in his head. Next builder comes along and he just literally prices up the doors. Doesn't give a shit that the, that the liners are fucked. He's gonna even make it work. Doesn't care. So he prices up the thing at maybe a thousand. So now these two prices are no longer comparable. But the investor's eye is on the cheaper quote, always. Well, he's gonna do it for a grand and he said two. So I'm gonna go with the one. But they're not comparable because they're not priced up the same piece of work. So maybe the investor's got a bit of confusion now. So what do I do next? So maybe I'll go out to market again and get a third guy around. Then the third guy might point out that, listen mate, when we pull this liner out, all the plaster's gonna come with it. It's all blown, I can hear it knocking. So I'm gonna pull the liner out, the plaster's gonna come with it. So therefore, I'm gonna add in a bit of plastering as well. So the third guy has gone in with liner, door, architrave, skirt, and a bit of plaster as well, and he might come back at two and a half. So he's now got three quotes, one at one, one at two, and one at two and a half. <laughs> two and a half. So 
But the investor's eye won't go to the two and a half and think I'm getting good value. The investor's eye is going to go to the one and try and make it work. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you're, if you're buying on the cheap, this is another point I need to make. If you're buying on the cheap and price is your sole driver, then there is nothing wrong with doing that at all. But what you must understand is that the other two quotes that you got aren't comparable with the one that was being quoted and the one that you've gone with. So the other two quotes that you've got, do go back to those guys and say, listen, this guy's come back at a, at a grand. However, he hasn't included for all this other stuff. Can you just give me a price for that specific piece of work that I asked for? I'm here to do this on the cheap. Can you just give me a price just for the door? I don't care about the arcs. I don't care about the skirts. I don't care about the liners or the plastering. Just give me a price just so I've got a point of reference to be able to compare. I hope that's made sense and I hope that's helped. I want to talk about doing what you said you do and I'm talking about paying you guys, paying your trades, paying your builder, paying your teams. Uh, so many people I hear and see on, on, in varying Facebook groups post pictures of stuff, post pictures of work, post pictures of stuff and, and the advice is generally just don't pay. Now, that's not a thing. Uh, there's nothing that's gonna break down a relationship quicker than you not paying your supply chain. They're going to disappear, and if they disappear, you, you know, the, that's it, that's the start of the end, really. So my advice is this. If you've got an issue with the work, then that issue needs to be raised as an issue, not as a, I'm not paying. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, that issue needs to be factual as well. So let's say, um, Let's say that the spark has been in. I'm just looking at a socket in this room now. That's not level. You can see that that one there. It's not level. So we could argue that we're not paying the spark because the socket's not level. We just need to go back to spark and say, listen, mate, before I pay you, can you square that socket up? That's going to have such a, uh, a much better, you're going to get a much better response and a better impact than saying, I am paying. I aren't paying, you're gonna, you're gonna lose that relationship, you're gonna lose your supply chain, and it's, it's critical to just do what you said you'd do in the first place. How much is a standard refurb? And then there might be the odd photo. Now, pricing up a standard refurb does not exist. There is no such thing as a standard refurb. Every single project is different. Every single project has a, is gonna have a variable, every single one. I'm coming from over 3,000 refurbishment projects. That's how many I've been involved with. And I can honestly say that no two have been the same out of all of them. So standard does not exist. I like to liken this to asking a travel agent, how much for a holiday? Imagine walking into a travel agent and saying that. Hello mate, how much will it be for a holiday? Morning, Jimmy. And they're gonna ask you a series of questions. Well, it depends on where you wanna go. Depends how long you wanna go for. What kind of board do you want? What standards are you after? How many star hotel? Location? Budget? All them things are really important in order for you to get a price for said holiday. Same as buying a car. Imagine walking into a garage and saying, how much is a car? How much for a car, mate? Again, brand, model, colour, size. Uh, what, what do you need it for? Morning. How many seats? Metallic pin. CD player. Do we still have CD players in cars? I don't think I've got a CD player. I don't know. Anyway, it's the same with a refurb. Absolutely the same thing. Because the word refurb means nothing at all when it comes to pricing up work. Just a generic term, I guess. It doesn't mean anything. We can't price up a refurb. Can only price up the elemental pieces of work that form said refurb. Same as the holiday. We can only price up the hotel night before, the flight. Hotel where we're staying in, how long we're we going for. I almost stack that package up, right? That's the same for your refurbishment project.